All right, welcome back to our second episode, our second pod, Todd, podcast. <laughs> I think we'll call it a Todd podcast for you. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm here with Todd Barrett today, and Todd has a unique perspective in real estate here in Hawaii because he's one of the few guys who's worked in the developer sales business and uh, the existing home business and has a really good perspective on how those two things differ and it's a really different experience for buyers so that's one of the big things we're going to talk about we also you and i really have a lot of fun talking about macroeconomic things <laughs> and so we can chat about that a little bit too and then just general what we're seeing in the market as well but tell people a little bit about you mm -hmm. uh, where you came from how you got here and some of your work history and how to get a hold of you sure uh how i got here is a really long story but i'll shorten it um, i was born on an air force base in tokyo japan uh, I lived overseas in about 13 different countries uh, for most of my life. Um, I uh, came back to the United States, graduated from the University of Arizona, and promptly went back to live in Asia. Uh, so I lived in Japan. I was a television producer there um, for about 15 years. Um, and then I kind of burned out. You know, the, uh, the Japanese work quite hard. So I ended up uh, leaving and going back home, but I couldn't adjust to the mainland life. Uh, I was so adjusted to kind of Asian uh, societal norms, I mm -hmm. guess you could say. Uh, and my father suggested I move to Hawaii, and that was back in 1999. And so I traveled up and down the, all the islands and lived on them for a short period of time and found that the, the Bay Island was where I wanted to live. And moved here, promptly got my real estate license because nice. I couldn't really find anything in media or, or television at the time. And, um, you know, it took off. Um, I've had, you know, the pleasure of working for a couple Japanese developers as well because of my language skills. Um, and now I'm here <laughs> at Next Home. So you're fluent in Japanese? Yeah, it was read, write, and speak. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was my first language, actually. Interesting. I had to be retaught English in school. No kidding. Yes. Oh wow! So that's I don't know that I realized that you were that fluent. I knew mm -hmm. you, I knew you had history. I passed Japan, the but... level one of the Japanese government's proficiency exam. Okay. So that means a minimum of ten thousand uh, kanji characters memorized, and any combination of those ten thousand. Ten thousand. Ten thousand. So you also have to be able to read a newspaper. Um, you have to be able to go through an interview. Uh, the television station that I worked for was uh, under NHK, the National Broadcasting Agency for Japan. Wow. I was a producer director at a station. I don't know how you do that because I can barely keep 26 <laughs> letters. It, was, it wasn't easy, but, uh, but I had kind of had a head start. So, Wow, that's pretty incredible. And how do people get a hold of you? They can get a hold of me either at a real simple email address, Kona Todd. It's two Ds, mm -hmm. K-O-N-A-T-O-D-D at gmail.com, the okay. ubiquitous Gmail. And um, my phone number is 808-937. One six two nine. Awesome. Okay, so let's get into the first thing, and this is why uh, I wanted to have you on. Is and I mentioned it earlier, the perspective that you have with developer contracts. And we don't have any developers here in Hawaii on Hawaii Island right now. I think there's still a lot going on on Oahu. Yeah, quite a bit. Um, but we don't see anyone here right now doing anything. No. So talk about talk about what it's like for a buyer. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, how it's going to be different compared to the normal process as far as putting in an offer, going through the entire escrow, waiting for something to be built, uh, and all the way to taking possession. What are the big differences that you see? So the first big difference actually starts from the time that you walk into a developer sales office. Uh, there's two different policies. There's one policy that if you walk into that office mm -hmm. and you sign a uh, informational sheet uh, and you do not put down a realtor, or you did not go there at the first visit with a realtor, your realtor, if you have one at that time, no longer represents you. You are essentially a customer. Got it. And um, there's that. And then there's the other kind, uh, which was my previous development, where we worked in concert with local realtors uh, so that if they came in and they were working with a realtor, we didn't step on that realtor's toes. We gave them credit whether they came in or not. Okay. So Th representation, representation right off the bat for a buyer, of course, is, is huge. Right. Uh, especially in a market like this, where you definitely want representation. Um, 
you just have to know that going forward. A couple good questions are, or even statements. I'm working currently working with a with a realtor. Um, will he be you know compensated a commission for this, uh, or am I being represented, or am I a customer in this transaction if I decide to move forward? That's really important because for if, for those who don't know, the difference between a customer and a client is significant. The duties, the responsibilities that you have to a customer are completely different from a client. A client is like an attorney-client relationship. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you tell me something, I keep it quiet, I have confidentiality, I look out for your financial uh, fiduciary interest, uh, things like that. If you're a customer, I just have to be truthful. Um, if I have a, a listing and someone comes to me as a customer and not a client as a buyer, and they say, well, this is listed at 600000 I'm going to make an offer for 550, Mike, but really I'll go to 575. That's not confidential. Mm -mm. I take it to my seller. I go, he said he'd go to 575. Absolutely. Now, if that's my client, it is confidential. Correct. So that's a big difference when they walk in that they're a customer instead yeah. of a client. And from my end, when I was working with the developer, another really big difference was, and I would try to do my best to explain this to customers. Um, first is, because you're coming in alone doesn't mean you're getting a better deal because the commission is now reduced. So that great question. Okay, yes. talk about that. So the developers, the developers see the price point completely different from the compensation to any representative realtor. They have two different buckets. This is what you find with corporate builders especially, is that they have different uh, budgets and um, goals and marks to hit and they're all separate. Because they're managing it from the ground up, their spreadsheets don't look like a regular existing home okay. spreadsheet. Everything is in its own bucket, from uh, optional finishes to standard finishes to the lumber. It really is broken down into this thousand you know, sheet checklist. Wow. And each one acts independently financially to the corporation. So the, so if you are if you're like wow I'm going to come in and I'm going to offer 3% less because I don't have representation they have to pay that's not how it works. They are strictly price driven. So they don't want to and from their perspective I can see it if I give you 3% less the next guy whether he has a realtor or not thinks he should get that same right, lower because deal. Right because remember that most developments are comping themselves what we know is comping themselves. Right. So they their comparable sales right. that the next appraiser who right. comes in to facilitate a loan is going to see mm -hmm. will be the previous sale within that development. So the developer is creating his own comp base. And the last thing he wants to see is a downward trend he, in costs. Right, because then the appraiser will come to them or the lender will come to them and say, hey, how come this one, which is an exact copy of the one next door, mm -hmm. was 30000 less? And then you have a problem. Uh, because you're essentially chasing your value down. Right. And so the developer understands this. And, and they'll, you know, I, I can tell you, we've uh, had to say goodbye to many qualified buyers because just because they didn't want to short their comp. Wow. So there's really no benefit to going there on There isn't. Your own. There isn't. And so I, you know, and that was one of the things I brought to the previous developer, as I said, we would do much better to work hand in hand with the local realtor base. Right. Whether they come in on the first visit or not, we need to build up goodwill. Right. And, you know, uh, it just is how, also it's how Kona works, as you know. You know, yeah. we all know each other. Right. Um, especially in, in our community, in the realtor community. Um, we know each other. We've all been here quite a while. Uh, we've done deals with each other. And the last thing that we would want to see is that happen to us. Right. And so there's a bit of uh, empathy involved as well. I find that's one of the differences in our market compared to others. When I talk to people across the country, you know, you work with some, if you're in Dallas and you work with someone, you're never going to work with them again, possibly. Mm. Um, and so it's more cutthroat because I it's that. never going to come back. Whereas, you know, we always kind of joke about it. Uh, big island, small town. You know, your reputation beats you in the door. Absolutely. And uh, you don't want to be known as someone like that because people aren't going to want to work with you. No. Um, and so it's, it's kind of nice. It's sort of this self-policing thing. Um, you kind of, people work together here better. It's something I've always enjoyed about our, 
real right. estate community. It's interesting because you know I, I was looking at houses in Las Vegas as a, a possible investment, and uh, you know developer sales are just everywhere. I mean, it's mm. pretty much all there is. Sure, um, there's I, it's, it's incredible rate of building, which is such a amazing thing to see coming from here where there's zero building. Um, but everywhere you went, you were signing in, and I was like, if I sign this, am I waiving my right mm -hmm. to have representation? And in many cases, you are. Yeah. So that's the first piece is don't expect to get a discount because you are not represented. Right. And if you're a customer, the next thing I would try to relay to people is that I represent the developer. Right. But this is also going to end up being a dual agency transaction, even if they're a customer. Okay. So it's the semi quasi. It was a very difficult line yeah. to, to set up. So what I would tell them is I can hand you the CCNRs, but I cannot answer any questions you might have about them. Right. Um, and that frustrated buyers because they felt like they weren't represented. Right. And I'm telling them, you're not. <laughs> you are not Correct. represented. Yeah. <laughs> and if you would like to bring a third party in, that's on your dime. That's right. If you would like to hire a consultant personally right. outside of the escrow, right. that's fine. And, right. and we, we had several of them do that, whether it was a, uh, a building engineer, a home inspector, uh, because even the getting to home inspections, that's a whole nother, you know. Or attorney. You can have an attorney. Attorney. We had several attorneys. Um we had people who had friends who lived here mm -hmm. who essentially became their proxy. Right. But <laughs> then I had to explain to them that you're the proxy for the customer. Right. So the rights uh, transfer over. I right. can't ex answer questions that you're posing to me either. Right. So it got frustrating for a number of buyers who really couldn't understand the difference between being represented uh, by a professional realtor and being a customer. Yeah. I can see how that would be tough. Absolutely. So, okay, so we, we, you get in there, you sign a contract, escrow, pro talk about from signing the contract mm -hmm. to moving in, kind of that process. Yeah, first, bit. your developer contract is gonna be anywhere from five to eight times larger than a regular HAR purchase contract. Are any of the terms in there negotiable? No. And that's another thing you're going to okay. find with developers. If you hand a developer contract to your lawyer right. and he marks it up right. and you send it back to the developer, right. the developer is going to put it in the shredder and <laughs> send you a fresh contract. Okay. Yeah. It's non-negotiable. I mean, nothing. Nothing. I. These are the terms. Yes I've or no. never seen any of the three developers I work for bend on any of the standard clauses within their contract. Interesting. And so... Wow, that's a lot. So you really have to understand what you're getting into. Correct. So this is actually making the news right now with lumber prices going where they've mm. been going in the last few years or last few months. They're starting to settle back finally. Uh, building prices have gone through the roof. Sure. And uh, what I'm looking at it here. Mm -hmm. from the, yeah. Some developer contracts had a clause for termination for convenience is right. what they called it. Right. And it was basically like, Hey, this ends up costing us a lot more than That's we correct. priced it. We need another fifty thousand, and if not, buy. That's exactly right. And you know, here's the thing, and <laughs> this is where my, um, you know, it's interesting going from an independent contractor that works for a local brokerage mm -hmm. to working full time, uh, essentially as a em broker employee for mm -hmm. a developer, and that is that um, your mindset becomes a little bit more corporate. There's a little less wiggle room. And in the termination for convenience section, they will win in court every time. I hate to put it like that, but yeah. these contracts are very straightforward. They are very plain language. Uh, so I would recommend to anyone, if you are not represented by a, by, by a you know, buyer's representative uh, or an agent or, or a broker, mm -hmm. um, hire an attorney, but hire a real estate attorney Right. Not just, a, you know, don't go to an accident and injury lawyer. Right. Go to a real estate attorney, hire him to go through that, maybe even walk you through it. It might cost you a little bit more, but I would rather pay a little bit more up front and say, wow, that does not work for me. Right. And walk away from the deal rather than having what is happening now, which is the termination for convenience, where essentially they call you up and say, uh, your house price just went up 50000 due to the cost of lumber. 
Uh, we need another 50,000 deposited into escrow to cover the lumber costs, or we will terminate the contract and give you your deposit back. All right. And most people, you know, from the articles I've been reading, they're like, we, we didn't understand this. This came out of nowhere. It and didn't, though. It's, it's in, in the, the contract. contract. And that yeah, was a, that's another frustrating part that I found with buyers is that they would say, well, this isn't in there. And I'd go, page 13, paragraph 2, line 7. Yeah. And, that, well, I didn't see that. Well, I'm sorry you signed it. And, I, I you know, I feel bad. But right. by the same token, and especially if they were unrepresented, right. the onus is, is not on me to read the contract for them. So um, article, I think it's 11 of the NAR Code of Ethics mm -hmm. is that you can't do business outside of uh, your area of expertise. And that Correct. doesn't mean geographic. It means, it can mean geographic, but not specifically. It also means, you know, having experience in somewhere. So if someone came to me and said, Mike, I want to hire you as my consultant on this builder developer contract. It's, it's, it's 63 pages. You know, tell me, <laughs> tell me what, I'm, what I'm getting into. I don't have any experience in doing that, so I wouldn't necessarily be, it wouldn't be ethical, but you do have experience. So Correct. if someone wants to hire you to be a consultant, just to let them know, not an attorney, but just mm -hmm. a consultant, sure, that'd be something that you could Absolutely. Do. And I've done that many times. Um, okay. uh, my previous development was for a, uh, a Japanese developer. So the first thing I had to do is translate their contract. Oh, that's a big business yes. on Oahu especially. Yes. So this was an actually an independent uh, contractor developer and um, so <laughs> I had to translate the contract so that made me responsible for the translation mm -hmm. so I actually hired my own translator to make sure that I was covered right and so uh, I've I have a lot of experience in going through developer contracts mm -hmm. putting them together building them essentially mm -hmm. um, so I have done that in the past so then you, you, everything's being built, everyone's happy, closing process is pretty much the same, get no. the keys, no? No, not okay. at all. all right. So here's another place where we find buyers uh, of uh, someone who has experience. You know, I've had people go, I've bought 13 homes in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm doing. Well, were any of them builder developer homes? Well, no, but that's, an, yes, it makes a huge difference. So first of all, let's talk about the inspection period. There is none. Oh. There is no inspection period in a developer contract unless it's specifically in there. My last three companies did not have one written in. And there's a reason for that. Most of the time when people are buying speculative homes or homes to be built, uh, they are being built. So you can't get your home inspection in the house until the house is completed, correct? Right. Well, the catch 22 is when your house is completed, the finish contractor then right. comes in and takes care of all the things that are issues with the home that just got finished. So you're not going to get a home that has issues. Got it. So it's, so we have these, this argument with people's times. Unfortunately, it, it, it has boiled down to that because we say, yes, you can have, you know, we're not taking away your right to hire a professional home inspector and come in and perform. You know, again, that's on your dime, that's your cost, but you can absolutely do it. But whatever the outcome of that report is, has nothing to do with this transaction. That's just your personal information Correct. that you can know, and then after you take possession of the home, you can go fix those things Correct. if you want to. This so we would have people that were adamant that these things had to be fixed before closing, and that's not how it works. Interesting. Yeah. You did have a walkthrough, but the walkthrough was typically on the day of closing after it recorded. Oh, wow. And the reason being is any developer worth their salt will give you a one-year right. builder's home warranty that includes a concierge provision. And what that means is any structural feature, um, so electrical, mm -hmm. plumbing, drywall, uh, lighting, roof, siding, you know, some of the major components and systems of a home. If anything happens to them, you call the developer, the, the contractor, he comes out, takes a look at it, fixes it for free. Got it. So every developer I've ever worked for, it's been a one year developer's warranty. Right. Okay. And, and they held, held by it. You know, right. some people believe it's a little more than that, okay. but it's very specifically spelled out. Okay. As to what they will do and what they will not do, but it's very good. 
I mean, it's better than you get with an existing. Oh, company. it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and what we found is we'll have people that are adamant about, you've got to fix this before closing. This needs to be done. And four months into their ownership mm -hmm. are happy as clams. Right. Because they've got a bulletproof house. Right. <laughs> Interesting. They're like, I ran out of stuff to call them about. Well, good. That's the way the system works with a developer contract. Whereas in an existing home, you get your J1 home mm -hmm. inspection, right. Content, right? You get the report. Yeah. You have a list of nine things. Mm -hmm. You talk it over with your realtor. You decide, do we want to, you know, ask for these to be repaired or replaced? Yeah. And if so, what's the timeline? You're also watching your J1 timeline to make sure it doesn't expire prior to that negotiation. Right. And then on top of that, there's also the cash in lieu of option, which I will sometimes give my buyers and say, we have a seller here who's on his way out. The last thing they're going to want to do is renovation. We can ask them for it. And I'm happy to do it for you. But have you ever thought about asking for $500, you know, closing cost credit in lieu of these repairs? Right. And it, the interesting thing is I'll find buyers and sellers are very amenable to that type of a transaction versus arguing over replacing a GFI. So I, I agree with that. And that's one of the things that I like to do. And it, it's, it does a couple things. I mean, it's, it's a really easy sell because number one, you know, especially here, so many of the sellers and especially now are off island. They don't really have the ability to get repairs done. Uh, and the people who do those services, the handymen and, and electricians and whatever, are so booked up They're right booked. now. It's just really difficult. The other thing that it, from the buyer's perspective is, if you, if you tell the seller you need to replace this, this, and this, they're going to find the cheapest person possible to do the lowest level Correct. of service just to get it done to fix those three things. Let's just get some money. You hire who you want, mm -hmm. get it done the way you want it done. If you say, I, I, I want a, a new refrigerator, fine. They're going to go get the refrigerator $350 renter special That's right. at Lowe's. Or you can say, I want 580 bucks for a new refrigerator, and you can go get you a stainless steel one. Exactly. And get what you want instead of something exactly. else. And so it ends up working out a lot cleaner just to do cash instead of those other things. It's, right. It's no, and I, and I agree. And so getting back to you know where this plugs into the developer contract versus the purchase contract mm -hmm. is that you have to trust the process when you're with a developer. It's going to feel foreign, especially if you've only purchased existing properties in your lifetime. Wow. It's yeah. going to feel wrong almost because it's not gonna have the same flow. Um, what we found is a lot of our buyers would be like, you know, I came in, I bought the property, and now here you are three months later telling me we're closed. I didn't have to do anything. And they feel like they're, they should be something. Even if we, you know, we follow up with them regularly, of mm -hmm. course. But they feel like they should be doing more. Right. Like they should, and that's actually not how it works. You, sh you don't want to be doing anything anymore until you get possession of that property, you live in it, you take advantage of that builder's warranty, right? Uh, and dial the home in. Nice. I can see how it's totally different. And I, I, was, I went through that in the 90s in Texas uh, when I was there building a home. And it was, it was different. I mean, I think actually that was the first home I ever bought. So I didn't know better. On anything, I didn't know what I was. I was just, you know, they're building a house and they're going to call us one day and it's ready. Um, I don't even know if we took advantage of the warranty, mm -hmm. the one-year thing. I don't know if we had any problems with it. It's been so long; it's twenty-plus years. But mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because just anytime I go on the mainland, you see houses being built all over, and it's just such a foreign concept to us here on Hawaii Island. I mean, right. it's very rare to see. Yeah, a place. and you know, the the truth of the matter is. Um, my previous, you know, developer, um, left the state. Um, they had, uh, had eight residential, uh, developments on five different islands, a very successful company, by mm -hmm. the way, huge. Um, but they found that the cost of doing business and the red tape of actually just building right. a home, uh, much less being a developer and coming in. Right. And when, because you bring infrastructure into that discussion at that point, uh, was didn't make any financial sense to them. They didn't lose money, but they certainly made a percentage, a very small percentage of what they would made building these same homes on the mainland. 
this is something our legislators and policymakers here in Hawaii really need to be aware of. And we're in an inventory crisis. It's happening everywhere, but we are unable to create new supply. Correct. And the reason is we make it hell. We do. Uh, we really do. I just saw in the newspaper uh, last week someone went to build. They have a six or seven acre lot they went to subdivide it into six one acre lots mm -hmm. and they got turned down sure and it's like they're they're, they're barely building and they're talking about market price homes mm -hmm. not luxury homes mm -hmm. and the county council shoots them down right and i understand that from a council standpoint um not to say i agree with it but mm -hmm. i understand it mm -hmm. so essentially what's happening now is and we saw this back in the early 2000s is that um if you're familiar with the Coloco Mauka area. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't strange then to have someone take a 20 acre piece because that was the nominal size right. and uh, break it down into four five acre mm -hmm. lots. Right. So in that case, it works great for the county because your density is low. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about somewhere in Kona, mm -hmm. within you know, essentially the grid right. area, Right. And you you take that six acre property, and you want to chop it up into six one acre lots. That's a lot more dense than something up on Coloco Mountain. And so what they're trying to do is spread these homes a little further apart. They don't want the density. I mean, and on top of that, then you have the water issue, which I'm sure right. you're aware of. There simply aren't water meters. Right. <laughs> there are not water commitments. Right. Uh, which I. I ask some of these new developers, well, how many water commitments were you able to secure right. for your new development? So, uh, you know, we're, and this is just my personal opinion, I think we're kind of reaching max capacity. And this flows a little bit over into the discussion, the post-pandemic tourism, mm -hmm. where we're, we're maxed out. You know, our islands are only so big, and we can only accommodate really so many people. Our infrastructure is taking a huge beating right now. Right. And I don't think a lot of people understand that's the discussion, at least from a realtor standpoint, Right. is that our roads, uh, <laughs> all of our infrastructure, water, uh, we're, we're on an island in the middle of the Pacific. You know, we, we don't have materials readily available. Uh, we only have so much fresh water. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the Kahalu'u well is salinated already. Yeah. So these are, you know, these are issues I think a lot of people moving here don't really understand. Um, and why I tell people who want to buy land and build, I sit them down and I have a very honest conversation with them. You know, and it's interesting because when you talk about some of the development attempts that we see out here, the problem that I run into, uh, from my, from my perspective is the County Council, they'll say, okay, first of all, our government hasn't done any of the infrastructure work. They make the developers do the infrastructure work for them. And then the, from the developer's perspective, like, well, that has a lot to cost. I can do it after I make some money. And then the county council goes, no, no, no. We want you to do the mm -hmm. infrastructure first. And they're like, well, okay. And by the way, we want these to be affordable homes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it's like, well, there's, it's impossible. The, the math is math. Mm -hmm. And it's just not possible. Right. And then you have conflicting ideas. So you talk about we're already at max capacity. But you talk to other people, uh, policymakers, uh, a former U.S. congresswoman, uh, was saying we need to do more infill and we need to build up, not out, um, <laughs> which doesn't align with the values of Kona. No. Um, uh, and, and so you have you know policies changing and ideas changing mm -hmm. constantly, um, and it's such a long timeline to get anything done that I can see it from a developer's perspective. Why would you come here? Right. There's so many other places that you're like, okay, we can get in there and we we can be out in ten years. Right. Which is a long timeline. And here it's like it could take 20 years so and we might even be shut down. That's exactly what happened with my previous employer. Yeah. Is that they came here 25 years ago with a 10 year plan. Wow. L literally. That's not an exaggeration. That's exactly yeah. what happened. Yeah. And it's going to continue to happen. And as, you know, as we continue to see people here really suffer with home prices going Correct. up and no affordable housing inventory. The policies that we have are going to only make it worse. Yeah, and I think that unfortunately there's a lot of developers who are here. Literally mm. they live here. Right. Uh, they're part of the community and they have solutions. Um, one solution that has baffled me since I want to say right around 2004 or 5 
is I know of a couple of local developers who have fantastic plans to build uh, sustainable tiny homes. Mm -hmm. And I mean really quality tiny homes. I'm not talking about a trailer. I'm not talking about a tent. I'm talking about a, a quality home right. that will last. Right. And you have the county council, which continues to make laws right. against this type of dwelling. Um, I mean, we're, we're going backwards here. We're, yep. we're not moving forward. That was just in the paper in the last week or two. Uh, and, and, uh, yeah. you know, and, I've follow, and again, I've followed this story since 2004, and it came up with some uh, contain, sustainable container homes, right. um, which would have been a fantastic development. You know, they just, someone has to sh shake them by the shoulders and get real with them. And, and the problem, you know, there's, actually I have a document somewhere where I have like eight or nine steps for improving housing in Hawaii, with number one being fixed Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hawaiians should not be sitting on the list Absolutely for 20 not. years. Absolutely not. It's a travesty. There's, it's ridiculous. But number two is we need to have an honest discussion about the fact that some of our ideals are going to compete with each other. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want affordable housing, great. If you want low density, that's going to be a problem if you want affordable housing because land is really expensive. Exactly. And the state is failing to decommission any land. So like from Kona to Waikolo, we have tens yeah. of thousands of acres. But we got the water issue. Correct. Well, the water department won't do any more wells. Uh, so it, it's just this loop. Um, and the end result is... The only large-scale development we've had in Kona since the recession is Kohana Iki. Correct. You know, five to fifteen million dollar homes. Correct. That's it. Yeah. Or the ones that I was working on, and that was a relatively small <coughs> development, but we, you know, we built forty-one homes in the span of four years, and those homes, you know, they actually started at a much more affordable price point, but that was still in the high seven hundreds. <laughs> For those homes now, I mean, yeah. today, uh, where the market is. They did uh, very well, the people that got in yeah, a little bit early. but We're going to run through a few more topics Absolutely. here. Absolutely. It's just so all tied together. It and is. I, and I hope people The surge in home that. prices and lack of inventory. Right, and we, do, next, we touched on that's that. That's where we're at. Yeah. It, it's going to continue until... There's one thing that I think might be coming. I talked to, uh, I talked to one foreclosure agent agent who just does a ton of foreclosures they're already in with the bank and one of our other uh, agents here in the company talked with another one and they've both said there's a bunch of foreclosures coming down the mm -hmm. pipeline absolutely that the bank is finally getting ready to release them mm -hmm. now the banks are going to make incredible profits off these I don't know if it's profit if you if you uh, look at how much time they've held these properties I mean some of these things have been sitting in their portfolios for 10 plus years now Oh, absolutely. It's incredible. But they're finally talking about um, releasing some of these. But the condition on these in, these foreclosures is really bad now. Um, and there's also a lot of them with title issues. We're seeing banks mm -hmm. just writing quick claim deeds. Oh, sure. No title insurance Well, whatsoever. look at what happened in that last uh, go-round with the leasehold properties that were foreclosed upon. Oh, I didn't know about this one. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a ton of uh, Bishop okay. leasehold that were foreclosed on. Okay. And the bank... The bishop would say, well, you can't foreclose on it. We so own it. We own the land. And your loan is with our lessee. Right. And for the improvements. Correct. You so they're like, you're to free to take, take the house. house. <laughs> you're, free to, you're free to take the house. That's it. <laughs> and so they were really left in the, and there was quite a few. And that's why we saw this, um, the direction and lending change locally to yeah. where you, it's almost impossible to get a loan on a leasehold. Home. Yeah, it's really tough. Um, what are you seeing in terms of changes with buyer profiles? Sure. Um, wow. Well, and I saw this between the um, volcano mm -hmm. and uh, when it was active. I believe that was 2018. 18, yeah. Between then and uh, the uh, initial start of the, of the COVID pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a pretty typical, what I like to call a typical buyer. And those were people who were, um, had finished their life. They were empty nesters. They had always dreamed of coming and living in Kona. They'd been traveling here for 20 years or maybe in the state. And it was their dream to come and buy a home in Kona and move here right. or 
have a second home here that they could go back and forth so that they wouldn't miss the grandkids, but yet they could have, you know, this wonderful place to come. And, and that, to me, was a typical buyer. When the pandemic started, those people literally disappeared from our buyer profile. And it became, first it became remote workers. Right. And they said, um, you know, I haven't been laid off. I've been put on full-time remote. And I've cleared it with my company. I can work remotely from anywhere in the world. I want to work from Hawaii. Yep. Okay, great. Well, welcome. The second type was a person, and, and I call this, uh, I don't mean it in any disrespectful manner, but I call it the 9-11 effect. Mm. If yep. you'll remember in 9-11, you know, people had to really take a look at their lives, at least I did, yep. and say, what's important to me? You know, if, I, if, if life is precious, life is short, and what do I value? And so for me, um, those type of, they're also known as black swan events. In mm -hmm. some cases, not so much in a negative connotation, but one that forces you to look inward at your values mm -hmm. and where you really want to be 10 years from now or five years from now. So we had those people and they essentially said, you know, I'm retiring in 10 years, but I'm done. I, I'm going to take a short retirement and we're selling everything and leaving. I, I don't want to wait for life to catch up to me. I want to go out and, and cut it off, essentially. I couldn't agree with you more. And so um, we found people that have made sacrifices, even though they're very, um, these are people also who ha are financially and fiscally responsible. You know, they've, they've done their 40 years of saving 401k, uh, you know, diversified portfolio. These people have a lot of money. Um, and, and it, uh, it, you know, hence the, the prices rising and all yep. cash deals, et cetera. But these people are making a, a lifestyle decision. They're saying, I can do four, five, ten more years working in California, or I can just take what I've got now, take my nest egg, which is great, uh, and, and I can start living. Yeah. And um, so those were the two people that, you know, that, those two buyer types, two, two buyer profiles that closed out our community. Yeah. And and within, you know, within 7 months, I sold our last remaining 12 homes in the inventory. A quarter of the inventory that you'd built gone out that that had taken 3 years to get to wow. was gone in 7 months. And that's it's it's kind of interesting cuz we're seeing like you know, everyone's talking about how prices are going up and 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 local folks are getting squeezed out. Uh, and I mean local. When I, when I say local, I mean people who live and work here Absolutely. of any ethnicity. Sure. Um, but there, it's kind of interesting because while prices are going out, out, I don't see those folks getting squeezed out right now other than that people who may enter the first-time home buyer market are finding it very difficult. And mm. th those guys are having a tough time. Um, it's, it's really almost impossible to compete. But this market, this flipping, this, this swap of... Uh, assets for money. Uh, this is mainland sellers and mainland buyers swapping mm -hmm. money. The the local community here, the people who live and work here, are really not participating in this. They're not getting money because if you sell, where are you going to go? So right. now you have to leave Hawaii. You want to stay in Hawaii? Are you going to sell and then buy something else? Well, the prices are going through the roof. Well, you can't sell and rent either <laughs> right. because. Rental prices are more than what your current mortgage is. Yeah, even I mean by quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, and that's going to be. I, I hope we see. I think we're going to see a surge in rental prices and a stabilization here after the seventh, when the eviction moratorium is over and people can. For those who don't know, uh, one of the governor's emergency orders here in Hawaii, starting in March of last year, was that there can be no rental increases, Correct. no rental price increases. However, that just means that people have stayed in their rentals, which has limited the supply of rentals. That normal turnover doesn't happen. So when something does come on the market fresh, you can raise your rent if it's an empty unit. Someone left and went back to the mainland. And you walk out there as a landlord and you say, wow, there's no competition. Mm -hmm. And there are a ton of people coming here. My condo that I used to get $1,800 a month for, I can now get $3,200 mm -hmm. a month. And so you're seeing rental prices just absolutely spike because there's this constricting of supply. Funny, we're talking about 
inventory for houses. What happens when you constrict supply (laughs) and demand uh, increases or even remains constant? If you're restricting supply, Mm -hmm. what happens to prices? Right. And and so we have all these discussions about affordable houses, whether it's whether it's rentals or sales. But if it's the same market forces, it's not complex. No, it it really is just supply. I I tell that to people. I say, you know, real estate is cyclical. Yeah. You know, you, you you can watch it. You can go back and and, you know, look at the history. Um, you can't predict it. I mean, you know, no one has a crystal ball. No, I, I, I could have never predicted right. what happened during the pandemic. Right. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had thought the opposite was going to happen. So when it literally turned on a dime, uh, I was just trying to keep up. Yeah. And, and I, I kind of put aside that why is this happening? Because it was. Right. And, you know, in this industry, you just kind of go with the flow. Pay attention to the numbers. You know, try to you know, represent your clients the best you can in a moving target environment. So you talk about that. Um, here we go. Here's a chart, and I'll, I'll for the for, for the people watching on YouTube, I'll have this chart up for the people listening on a podcast. Uh, you can check us out at our YouTube channel, Mike Drew Tar Hawaii Real Estate, uh, and you'll see this chart. So what I'm tracking here are a few things. We're going to start off. This is a residential uh, market for North Kona and South. Is this Kohala. medium? So this is meeting up here in the orange line. And you can see that, you know, we're sitting around upper sixes, lower sevens, and then, you know, March of 2020 happens. Mm -hmm. See a little plateauing, we see the prices go down, down, down uh, a few months in a row. Uh, I think that's the initial lockdown. Correct. And then you see, and look at the demand. So this is the unit sold. Gray is properties over 1.5 million. Yellow is all the rest. Um, you can see just this plummet here of, of units sold from 73 in a month to, uh, actually 77 in a month to 33. 30. Wow. So really it crushes. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost eight mm-hmm. plus mm-hmm. months of just absolute incredible gains in units sold. Yeah, that's A amazing. little breather. It, you, the prices just shoot up, but it's pretty clear that, uh, Bottomed out in May, and then from there, just... It, oh, that's almost 300% increase. It's incredible. And units sold is pretty nuts. But we see this pretty decent little trend line here going of median prices. We come mm-hmm. over to the condos. We see a lot of the same thing. Bottoms out. Condos were a little slower to recover because you couldn't rent the darn thing out on short-term vacation. Yeah, it was for a interesting um, in that you see that climb coming out of May. Mm-hmm. Um, but we saw prices dolphining. Yeah. So while you had this uh, unit sold number going up, you, you really found that uh, the prices were not, hadn't stabilized as much as home prices had. All the way in here, this is up to the minute data or earlier this what, look morning. look at that bottle rocket. We, we just hit a bottle, ro- yeah. It's just, it's gone almost vertical here to the median price of a condo from 515,000 in June to 650,000 in July of this year. Which is indicative of the uh, inventory in the single family home market. Yep. Where do you slide down to? Right. Condominium. People are buying these condos, and, I, and there's a lot more short-term vacation rental condos, a lot of things in the resorts. The, the residential condos aren't selling as much uh, as those higher-end condos, uh, and that's what's pushing that. And that unfortunately, up. and this, is, this gets back to our previous conversation, is that effect of the um, uh, short-term vacation rental condominiums is pumping up the prices on what we would call just, you know, community condominiums, right. uh, you know, where people who just work and live in town. Right. And that is also an affordability issue. Right. Um, it's almost like it's, I don't want to say false equity, but it, it, I, I tend to have a problem with that Yeah. because it, it doesn't feel like it's f- fair almost market wise. Yeah. You know, it's I like agree with that oceanfront condo vacation rentable at, a thousand dollars a night and there's a guy up a hill in a you know 30 year old condominium who's seeing his neighbor's value shoot up and them selling it, it's it's you know but it's supply and demand i mean that's what it is <laughs> i don't know what to tell you yep until we get more supply and then here's my favorite chart for now this is the residential this this, this orange line so all the yellow and the gray on here is the same as the residential mm-hmm. chart the orange line is the 90th percentile sale over the last 90 days. 
Uh, and so we see this is the luxury market. We see that we're in the 1.8, 1.9 range. Then comes here comes March 2020. We're, we're bottoming out here in the 1.4 range. And then we see this incredible spending of money. It goes from 1.4 million is the 90th percentile wow. to 2.8 million in April. And you're thinking, wow, that's that's incredible. That's 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 a doubling. And, and then, then it just bought And then May says again. you ain't seen nothing yet. Wow. Four point five million in May, four point six million in June. And these are ninety day cycles. Mm-hmm. So I've got a good sample size. This is six hundred sales. That's good data. Yeah. Now we're seeing it come back down three point eight million right now over the last ninety days. And so you got March, April, May, nearly thirty sales every month over one point five million dollars. Um, so there's just luxury spending here. So mm-hmm. now with that, I want to show you one more chart, which I think you've probably seen. Uh, M2 money stock. Ah, yes. The old M2. So this is a measure <laughs> of all the dollars that are out there. Yes. That plain and simple. And it's measured in billions of dollars. And so we start off in 2015 with <laughs> 12,000 uh, billions. So that's one point. That's 12 trillion. Trillion, yeah. Yeah, it's 12 trillion. And it has this, you know, pretty steady line increasing. It's but it's, it's definitely going up all the way to February of 2020, 15 trillion, and then CARES Act one, CARES Act two, CARES Act three. August of 2020, it goes. It had gone from 15 to 18 trillion. Here's what I don't get. Mm-hmm. CARES is done. Right. Where's where? So now we're in January 2021. How are we still going up at this accelerated rate? Sure. I think a lot of that, you know, you. You had the stimulus payments, obviously, um, and now you have the, uh, uh, the, oh, child, yeah. the child tax, tax credit. care credit, yeah. um, which is feeding into that. I also, you know, I'd have to do some more um, research on this. Uh, I, I think a lot of this is also driven by um, infrastructure, national infrastructure, some smaller things getting passed, and some money being thrown at essential places we've seen a couple bridges um uh, anything that's controlled on a federal level right that just has to be done but it's a very interesting climb there you know which brings the whole inflationary discussion up and you know i've heard so many opinions at this point Mm -hmm. i honestly don't know what to think i mean we're obviously in an inflationary period right whether you think it's transitory or not, right. we're in one. Right. And so the discussion then becomes, how long is a transitory period? Right. <laughs> right? So this is the question I always have for economists that they kind of have a problem answering because there is no answer. Well, it ends when it ends. Right. Okay, well, what if it ends and we're at, you know, a certain level, you know, if we're still at 18 bill, a trillion, um, are we going to see it come back down? Right. And then if, if it doesn't, if that's the new normal, quote right. unquote, then how does that jive with the Fed interest rates? Right. Because, you know, it, if, you, if you're lending money at 3% and inflation is at 4.5, <laughs> well, that's free money. Right. Right. (laughs) I mean, essentially, you know, from a macroeconomic standpoint, the bank's giving you money to borrow. Right. And which only increases the amount of money in the system. Right. So, you know, I don't know. And (laughs) and I don't know. Unlike Japan, where every time they try to spur on the economy and they put money out there, Mm -hmm. the Japanese people, by and large, put it in the bank and save it. Correct. Uh, Americans don't do that. <laughs> no, we we're, we're a it. consumer-based nation. You know, and that, that's really the difference between inflation and stagflation. Right. You know, Japan, which is the longest stagflationary period yeah. in world history, essentially. Right. You know, um, I don't see that happening to us just no. because we're consumer-based. Unless, again, we have another black swan event. And then, you know... Everything's off the table at that. See, I'm wondering if some of this money here is just going in to the pockets of the fat cats, and that's why we have this well, spike of course. in luxury I mean, spending. And I mean, that leads on to a whole other socioeconomic discussion yeah. about where's wealth, the disparity between wealth and classes. It seems to be a, a getting even worse in the last it is. year and a half. It is. And um, 
what we're finding is the people with money are making more money yeah. on the money they have. And they're doing it a little bit differently than last time. You know, it was leverage last time. Right. Now these people have learned because they got caught short in, in 07, 08, 09. Yeah. And now they're being smart about it. They're not leveraging. They're doing chunky, big turnovers and they're going for volume. It's a trip. It's, it's been a wild um, year and oh, a half. Oh, we're not done yet. I know. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Inflation versus stagflation. Yep, that's, that's our other. <laughs> I didn't even see that. Great. Okay. Uh, Good. I'm glad we got Are that. business owners investing and expanding with all this money? What do you think on that? You know, that's another great topic for a local discussion here for Kona. Um, I have seen a few uh, restaurants that started out as food trucks mm -hmm. that are expanding into physical locations. Nice. Um, you know, it's, it's hit or miss here in Kona. You know, that could either be the death nail of your business because you expanded too quickly yeah. or you took on too much debt load and you just didn't have um, the money coming in from sales. Um, but I think by and large, we came out of this rather unscathed as per the reports I'm hearing from the mainland, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to businesses like um, activity brokers mm -hmm. and... Uh, restaurants, bars, uh, while they were shut down, we do see them opening up again. Right. And, um, you know, the next discussion on that then becomes, well, here's the, here's the business owners wanting to expand again, wanting to jump back in and invest, and the workforce is gone. Right. So the workforce either left, literally physically got up and left the island right. during the pandemic, or they, were, they retrained for a better job. So you have, I, I know personally two um, food service uh, industry waiters, mm -hmm. waitresses, who went back to school during the pandemic, and they're both uh, working in the hospital industry. Now. Oh wow! They're they're working in healthcare. That's great. They're making more money. Yeah. And it's a stable job with healthcare benefits. Absolutely. So that no one talks about that strata. That actually is a very large amount of the workforce did that it's locally here. Interesting. Uh, you know, so just because they, you know, there's this whole talk of people are, you know, staying on the dole right. and, and not going back to work. I, that's, that's not true. First of all, uh, the unemployment insurance paid for by your own taxes, by the way. Right. You know, the people who worked. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, they tightened down uh, back at the, uh, the end of June. Okay. Um, uh, PEUC is being cut off. I think you saw that. Yeah. Um, we're coming up against the eviction moratorium. Yep. And then we will be coming up against the foreclosure moratorium. Yep. It's not that there aren't people to work. It's that they're either not here anymore, those service industry jobs, or they have retrained and are working in a different industry. They wouldn't got a better job. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's all I have for today. Do you have anything else you want no, to talk about? No, that was good. That we was, covered a lot. I call that, that, like my kids say, that that was a thick conversation. That was good. I hope everyone <laughs> uh, listening at home liked it. Uh, be sure to subscribe. We'll get some more out to you. We're going to put these out every three or four weeks. I appreciate uh, Todd coming by again. Thanks, I'm Mike. Mike Drutar, Principal Broker of Next Home Paradise Realty. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you again soon, guys. Aloha.